God. God, thank you for thank you for this mission that you've given to us. Uh, to see that to be a part of um, people all over the world, over all time, coming to know you. God, thank you for uh, being willing to uh, lay down your life through Christ to bring the world to you. I pray that that would be central uh, to our understanding of uh, of the gospel, it would be central to the understanding of how we are supposed to, to live our lives. God, I ask you tonight as uh, we talk about the humanity of Jesus, um, that the gospel would shine through um, this topic. So we give you this time this evening and um, ask for your grace to, to listen to understand, God, give me grace in communicating. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, you guys can head back to your seats. And as you guys are heading back to your seats, if you're in your seats, you're more than welcome to open God's word physically in a Bible to Philippians 2. We're going to start off going through verse Five through eleven, Philippians two five through eleven. Uh, as I as I mentioned, we're we're continuing our series uh, teaching about Jesus Christ. It's uh, it was Eric's idea, and you know he brought it up. It's like yeah, that'd probably be good to really expound on who Jesus actually is as. The Word of God exhorts us to revolve our lives around Christ. So here we go. When the, fin- when the infinite becomes finite, the, the humanity of Christ. Uh, this week, Max and I, we're, we're on a bike ride together. He's my four-and-a-half-year-old son. And I turn over to him, and I say, hey, buddy, I love you. And he goes, daddy, I love you too. And I said, you know, Max... I really love being your daddy. Max goes, yeah, daddy, I really love being your daddy too. (laughs) And it's clear to me that Max has no idea the expand, what that term actually means, daddy. He, He understands it's a term of endearment, but he doesn't have a full grasp of the implications of my identity, that I am his daddy, that I played a part in creating him. That when I go to work, in part, I go to work for him. When I come home and I pray to God to, to help me love my family, and praying for him. And when I'm anxious about him, it's in part because I'm his dad and I care about who he is and I care about who he's becoming. It's part of being his dad. And my hope this evening is that we would better understand and grasp the truths of the implications of Jesus' humanity for our lives, that the infinite God willingly became finite in a man, Jesus Christ. So Philippians 2, verse 5 through 11. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used For his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of man. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's powerful. And if you're not a Christian in here, it says that 
every person, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess eventually here on Judgment Day that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's better to do it now. He is. He is Lord. He's made it clear. So tonight we're going to answer two questions and make one point of application from the text. So the first question, what does Philippians 2 communicate implicitly and explicitly about Jesus' humanity? Implicitly and explicitly, what does it communicate about Jesus' humanity? And, and to help you guys remember this in the future, I'm going right along the lines of uh, Builder. You know, some of you guys may be wearing those Builder shirts, BLDR. I know it's like old school, like two years ago. They don't make them anymore. But I think they don't make them any not more, not because someone forced them to change their name, but because it was theologically uh, lacking. They forgot the A, right? Yeah. Birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension. Can't forget the ascension. It's very important. So what does Philippians 2 communicate implicitly and explicitly about Jesus' humanity? First, birth. Birth. He was born. Verse 7. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come, the word is genomai or genomai, means to be, to become, or to be born as a man in his extern external form. He was born. He was born. Have you ever wondered why Matthew and Luke spend time talking about Jesus' birth and then very little about his life until his ministry? There's probably many reasons. One of the reasons, obviously, is to display the fulfilled promise of David that his heir would rule and reign. He's talking about Jesus and Jesus' Joseph's Lineage goes back to David. He's from the line of David. And Mary's lineage goes back to the line of David. It's kind of wild. <laughs> but secondly, it's to highlight Jesus' humanity. Why would Jesus' birth highlight Jesus' humanity? Well, all humans are born. All of them are born. If you've ever met a human that wasn't born, they're not a human. Every single human was born. I read, uh, saw a, a blip in an article today that, that said that um, they just have um, created the first uh, uh, embryos without humans at all. It's kind of a funny thing to read on a day like today. But anyhow, they're still not born. Being born is a process of humans. So the fact that Jesus was born, and they highlight that Jesus was born, it highlights his humanity. Secondly, Philippians 2 highlights Jesus' humanity in that he lived life. Implicitly, if he was born and he died, then he also lived. Verse 8, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. He died. It's all clearly he lived a life. His life was a life of becoming obedient, obedient to his, his father. And in his life, he was fully human. The infinite becomes finite. So he had a finite mind. He had a human, Jesus had a human mind. Luke 2.40, the, the boy grew up and became strong, filled with wisdom, and God's grace was on him. So he learned the ABCs. And he learned how to count, or whatever the ABCs are in Hebrew. He learned to count. He learned to speak. He learned interpersonal communication. He learned to feed himself. He learned to clean himself. I don't mean to be crass, but currently my first question to Max when he comes out of the bathroom is, buddy, did you wipe? Because he's batting about 300 right now. <laughs> Max has to learn how to clean himself. I don't know what it was like in antiquity at that point in time. But he had to learn how to do that as well. 
He learned reason. He learned logic. He learned how to make things as a boy in in his dad's carpenter shop or whatever they had. Joseph didn't just let him go in there and just have his way and everything that, that he made came out perfect from day one. He had to learn how to be a carpenter by his father. So he had a, he had a finite mind, just like us, learned just like us, grew just like us. He had a finite body. Luke 2.42, the boy grew up and became strong, filled with wisdom, and God's grace was on him. So he became strong. He was not strong, and then he became strong. He was a boy, and he became a man. He did what boys do. So I just wrote down just what my boys did yesterday as I was, Lindsay was working and I was watching them, okay? So take my kids on a walk. Elle's in the stroller, Bo's in the stroller, Max is on his bike. And Max, he, he's on the sidewalk and he stops suddenly ahead of me and there's just this giant mound of ants. And he starts playing with the ants and there's ants crawling up all over him. Daddy, these ants are really, really awesome. Can we play with the ants? And then he, as he got on his bike, he rode right through the ants. (laughs) And then he was a little bit ahead of me, and there's a really busy intersection on our way to the park. And I don't know, not very far ahead of me, but I I get up to him, and he has his pants all down almost to his ankles. Max, what are you doing? I just got to go potty. Yeah, buddy, okay. There's like a thousand people crossing paths right here. Looking at you. Pull up your pants. Just wait till we get the park, bud. And then he stopped someone on the bike trail because they had cute dogs. Hey, can I pet your puppies? Which is, which is cute. And Bo was really pumped to do that as well. Then we got home and stopped it to pester the ants again, and he spit a loogie right on them. <laughs> Later that evening, we were out for another walk, and Max was riding his little gator thing. And Bo... He stood up and Max accelerated and he Bo tipped out, out the back into the, into the bed and nailed his face and his forehead. He was fine, but like that just, that just happens. And I'm highlighting his humanity, especially his boyhood, because he, he went through that stage. And I don't know what the ancient uh, equivalent of all those things that were ha- happening, but Jesus went through some of those things with his brothers and with his Sisters, he got hurt. He went through puberty. As a carpenter, he hit his thumb with hammers and got slivers and cut himself and had to learn how to bind his cuts and heal himself. Of course, in his ministry, it says that he was hungry like us. He was thirsty. He got thirsty like us. He became tired. Something that that God infinite Self, a self-sustaining nature of God does not get tired. God created the world with the, with the word of his voice and was, was not exhausted. But Jesus became tired. He became weak. Jesus had finite emotions. He had human emotions. John Calvin said Christ... He put on our feelings along with our flesh. He marveled. He was sorrowful. He was troubled. He wept. He was in anger. He was in anguish. All the feelings that you and I feel, yet he was sinless. He was completely righteous righteous in his emotions. His anger did not ever turn to bitterness. His concern never turned to anxiety. So how human was Jesus? He was real human. He was fully human. 100% human. So human that his brothers, John 7, 5, even his brothers did not believe him. They didn't believe in him when he was doing his miracles. They didn't believe in in him when he was communicating that I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. They didn't believe in him. Why? (laughs) Probably because of their sin nature. 
and the fact that Jesus would call them out and what, what, was lo- what Jesus' logic and reason made them angry and frustrated them. And they were angry and they hated Jesus. And they grew up with him. First century uh, Nazareth. That's where he's from. <laughs> and... Uh, and they shared room, a room together. And there's nights that he couldn't sleep, just like them. And there's probably bickering and arguing, and, and he was just in their lives. And they didn't believe that he was God. They didn't believe he was who he said he was. Now we're going to drill into this later, but, but again, Jesus was sinless. I don't want anything that I've said, uh, uh, I don't want you to get the idea that, that Jesus sinned. That is not what the word of God teaches. It is, he was completely sinless and praise God. But he did have a human nature. Hebrews 4.15 For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. Philippians 2 tells us about his life. Philippians 2 tells us about his death. Verse 8, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Another sticking point of humanity is that 10 out of 10 humans will die. Death, physical death, is a part of the human life. Why was Jesus taken off the cross? Because his body was dead. They wanted to bury him, and they, and they, and they didn't break his legs, which was custom, customary of the crucifixion. They didn't, why didn't they break his legs? The, the reason that you break their legs is so that they suffocate faster, so, you can, so they're not up there for so long, so you can get onto whatever you're doing. Obviously, for the Jews, they were concerned about getting prepared for the Sabbath, having Jesus off the cross for the sake of the Sabbath. He had a funeral of sorts. They buried him, a ritual burial in a tomb. Joseph of of Arimathea said, here, he can use my tomb. And they buried him. They wrapped him in linen. It's what you do to a human body when at that point in time when they die, they put spices on him because they didn't want him to stink as he rotted there for three days. <clears throat> Jesus died. Philippians 2 speaks of his humanity and that Jesus died. Philippians 2 speaks of his resurrection and this. <clears throat> For this reason, God highly exalted him. After his death, how did he highly exalt him after his death? Well, first he was resurrected from the grave. Jesus' body was gone. All that you had to do to refute the claims that Jesus was God in the flesh is is that his body was still there rotting. You you just got to have the body. They didn't have the body. The resurrected Jesus ate fish. Luke 23, 20, 42 through 43. So they gave at his, at, when Jesus appeared to them, they're like, wow, this is kind of weird. He's like, hey, let's eat. Why, why would Jesus eat? That's a very specific detail. And it says that it was broiled fish. Is that right? That's so specific. He ate broiled fish. Such a weird thing for Jesus to say, hey, let's eat some fish together. But Jesus was communicating, I am here. I'm present physically. My physical body has resurrected from the grave. This detail is to display to his disciples that he's still human. Still human in his resurrection. Philippians 2 communicates to us about Jesus' humanity in his ascension. Verse 10, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. Why will every knee bow? In part, because he, as a man, 
ascended from the grave. Acts 1.9, after Jesus ascends, sorry, after Jesus is resurrected, and then, and then at the beginning of Acts, he's preaching to his disciples for 40 days and showing himself to people, showing his hands, showing his side, saying, I'm resurrected, I'm here, baby. Don't forget it. I'm alive. I've conquered death. Jesus says, go. Go to all the world. Start here and go there. Preach my gospel. And he said these things, First Acts 1.9. When he said these things, the Great Commission, that is, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and, and a cloud took him out of their sight. He was human. That, that's, the, that's one of the points of the ascension is that he was taken up to heaven as in, in his glorified body as a human. So what does the ascension tell us about Jesus' humanity? First, Christ truly was and remains a true human being right now. Right now. Second, Jesus Christ as fully God and fully man. Oh, I skipped a verse. Uh, Hebrews 10, 12. But this man, the writer of Hebrews says he's man. This man, after offering one sacrifice for, for sins forever, he was the propitiation, he was the substitute, the one that we needed. This man... sat down at the right hand of God. So right now he's a man. He's a God man. He was when he was born and he is now he's in, in his resurrected state. So Philippians tells us in Jesus' humanity he's born. He, he lived life. He died. He had human emotions. He had human, a human mind. He had a human body. He was resurrected and he ascended and human for all of those and human now. Second question, okay, why? Why was Jesus' full humanity necessary? Why does this topic even matter to you and I. And I'm, I'm sure you've put the pieces together, but it matters. It matters a lot. First, Jesus' full humanity is necessary to be our representative obedience. It's necessary so he could be our representative obedience. If Jesus wasn't fully man, you and I cannot be made righteous. That's a bummer if he's not man. If he wasn't a man and, and he isn't still a man, but praise God that he is a man and he was a man when he lived on earth. Romans 5, 17, for if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through one man, that's Adam, how much more will those who receive God's abundance provision of gra abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. So Paul states that Jesus' obedience is accredited to the Christian. One man's trespass for a one man's disobedience. One man's disobedience, sin cover the earth. One man's Obedience made it possible for him to be our representative obedience. <clears throat> if Jesus wasn't fully a man, you are not and cannot be made righteous. If Jesus wasn't fully a man, isn't fully a man, you are not and cannot be made righteous. You don't have a substitute for your disobedience. 
<clears throat> Number two, Jesus' full humanity is necessary to be our substitute sacrifice. So if Jesus wasn't human, again, you are still in your sin. In the story about Abraham and Isaac, God says, Abraham, go sacrifice your son that you've waited a really long time for. And you've went through a lot of pain and suffering to have. That son, Isaac, go sacrifice him. Isaac's 12. And they're walking, you know, to Mount Moriah. And Abraham tells his servant, hey, wait here. I and the boy, we're going to go up, make our offering. We're going to come back, which is weird, right? Because he was told, you're going to, you need to kill your son. So they walk up, and then the 12-year-old, reason and logic here, hey, Dad, uh, I love you. <laughs> Where's our offering? We're, <laughs> we have the wood, but where's the lamb? And Abraham says, what does he say? God will provide himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And I wonder if he was really confident or if he's like, you know, let's just get up there, <laughs> buddy. Just follow me. And then, he goes to bring down the knife on his son. And God stops him. Abraham. And what did God provide up there? Did he provide a lamb? This is important. Verse 13. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. <laughs> Didn't he say a lamb? God's going to provide a lamb? I wonder for the longest time. That's so weird because he didn't actually provide what Abraham said that he was going to provide. And this is a foreshadowing <laughs> what we need. Not a lamb. We need a sufficient substitute. We need the lamb. He gave a ram so that we can look back and say, ah, we need a lamb. And we've got Christ. Revelation talks about him being the lamb of God. We don't need a lamb. We need the lamb. We need an adequate substitute. Every year, the priest in the temple, and the temple was built on Mount Moriah, which may be 300 feet away from Golgotha where Jesus was killed. This is why. Mount Moriah, where, where Abraham was said to go up to sacrifice Isaac. It's the same place where David built the temple it would have been the same place that the priests went in to the most holy of holy places to sacrifice a lamb for the sin of the people. And then God on the day of the year where the lamb was sacrificed, I believe this is right. <laughs> Jesus was killed. 300 feet away, 300, 300 feet away on Golgotha. He's the lamb. Not a lamb. They needed human blood. We need human blood. We need infinite human blood. So Jesus, God, he had to be a man. And in that, he is the spotless lamb of God, the sacrifice. He's the lamb that we need. If Jesus isn't a human, you're still in your sins. He's the lamb that had perfect, spotless human blood. Number three, Jesus, 
Jesus' humanity is necessary to sympathize as high priest. If Jesus is not human, then he cannot truly sympathize with our weaknesses. Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet is without sin. But is Jesus really able to sympathize with our sins? I mean, he was divine. He had the ultimate cheat code, right? He, I don't, he did not use it. He did not bank on his divinity to keep spotless. Because if he did, then he could not sympathize with us. <clears throat> it, says, it says he sympathizes with our weaknesses and has been tested in every way. And he's, if he's tapping into his divinity all the time, he, he's, not, he's not sympathizing with our weaknesses. He's not actually tested in every way that we are. Who here has run a mile before? How about two? How about five? How about ten? How about half marathon? How about a full marathon? Yo, okay. <laughs> How about an Ironman? Okay, half marathon, put them up. Half marathon, nice, Okay. So who knows the pain and suffering that is required to say no to your comfort in a half marathon? You got you right here? Nope. Her? Him? And him? Brooke? JMO? Dill? I can't I can't remember who else was. If you want to show yourself. Yeah, Jordan. Now, okay, so imagine, like I'm saying, hey guys, I'm gonna, we're going to run a marathon together, okay? And we show up to the race, and I got my electric scooter, all right? And we're like going along, and I'm like, hey guys, I'm totally fine. We're at mile five. I'm like, hey, can we go a little bit faster? I, I got to be home at this time because I got to make dinner for my family. Okay, ha ha, funny. You keep going, mile 13. Oh, my legs are getting tired from standing on this thing. And we get done, and we're like, I'm like hugging you guys. Yeah, way to go. We did it. <laughs> did we do it? Did I, was I tested? Yeah. Was I tested in every way that you guys were tested? No. No. My body was not screaming like your body was screaming. My body might have been screaming as much as your body was screaming because I'm very out of shape. But, my, but, but we were not tested in the same way, in the same scenario. If Jesus continually was dipping in order to overcome temptation, if he was dipping into his divinity, then he cannot sympathize with us. Then he cannot then he was not tested in every way that we are. <clears throat> C.S. Lewis says, Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. We never find out the strength of evil impulse inside us until we try to fight it. My life has never been more conflicted than since I became a Christian. Do you guys, do you guys feel that? Like, until I started to try to walk with God, there wasn't a lot of conflict in my life. I mean, there was conflict, but there wasn't a lot of conflict internally. I just said, this is how I feel. I'm going to go do it. And Christ, because he was the only man who never yielded to temptation, this is C.S. Lewis's quote still, is also the only man who knows the full, the, uh, what full temptation means. He is the only complete realist. You think you're tempted and tested and tried? Jesus 
is the only complete realist. And if this is true, not only can Jesus sympathize with everyone in every way, but we can't even begin to sympathize with him about his suffering and temptation. You know, we think oh, it would have been hard for the devil to approach me at 40 days in a fast in the wilderness. And how does Jesus combat? Word of God. Man does not word live on bread alone, but on every mouth, on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And we shirk that off, like, oh, whatever. <laughs> like, I bet that was really tempting. Remember, Jesus, you just have to say bread. Bread. And you can have bread. Have you suffered? In temptation, are you suffering? He suffered more. That's awesome, because if he was not human, if he did not suffer like us, if he was, cannot sympathize with us, then, then if you're a Christian, and those times where you feel really alone, like really alone, like alone, 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 And no one's ever done anything like this. No one's ever felt this way. No, one, no one's ever experienced any sort of suffering like this. If Jesus can't sympathize with us, then you truly are alone. But that's the glory of knowing Christ, is that literally anything that you go through, Jesus never allows you to go through anything that he was not willing to go through, and it's displayed on the fact that he died on a cross for men. It's displayed in the fact that he came down to earth as a man. Though he was God, he did not consider equality with God a thing to cling on to, but he humbled himself. What kind of temptation and weaknesses? Every kind. What's in your mind? What are you asking? Probably that. Is he, did he go through this? If you boil down all of those things to their, to their root of what it, is, what it actually is that you're struggling with, everything, all of those, I don't have a compre comprehensive list. Pride. Uh, per personal glorification, wealth, anxiety, fear of man, sexual temptation, yet yeah, he was without sin. If Jesus is not human, he cannot truly sympathize with our weaknesses. But praise God that he is. He truly sympathizes with our weaknesses. <clears throat> so how do we apply the humanity of Jesus in our lives? Well, Paul, in the passage, we're just going to go back to verse 5. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus. And in the passage, Paul is urging Christians, hey, be a light to people in the church. Be a light to those outside of the church. Be about the gospel. We want the gospel, the reality that Jesus Christ is the only savior of the world, and you have sin and you need a savior and so does your friend and their friend and their friend and their friend. Be about propagating that. So how do you do that? He says, well, first of all, make your attitude that of Christ. The attitude of Christ is one of humility. He says it before he gets into highlighting who Jesus was and his humanity and divinity, the passages that we went through, verse 6 through 11. But verse 3 says, Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit. In humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should, not, should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. This is insane to preach in today's culture. To consider others as more important than yourselves in the culture of self-glorification and instant gratification. This is insane. He says, but make your attitude that 
of Christ Jesus. Then he proceeds to explain Jesus' humility, highlighting Jesus' humanity, that he's born, that he died, that he, that he lived, that he had a human body, that he resurrected from the grave and he ascended into heaven. He was glorified in his human body. And Paul isn't joking. <laughs> he says that we should approach people like Christ did as more important than yourselves. Not only looking not only out for your own interests, but the interests of others. Side note, I think that that's why um, you guys have an influence on your friends. Uh, you guys, you, like, I love you guys, and you guys rock. And I know that you guys can work on that a lot more. But you guys love each other. And you guys in general, you know, especially if you compare to the culture, but in general, you guys, you guys do, I know that you guys do think about others as more important than yourselves. So I'm proud of you guys. I think it's why God has continued to bless your influence. I mean, a lot of you guys are around and heard the gospel because people that didn't have any business caring about you cared about you. And praise God, we get to keep going. Make your attitude that of Jesus Christ. Another way to say this is, I used to say this a lot as a young Christian, and I just remembered it as I was preparing for this, that I want to become a stepping stone for believers and non-believers alike to experience the grace in Christ Jesus. Be a stepping stone. That's what it looks like to make your attitude that of Christ Jesus. <clears throat> and it's interesting that Paul assumes that the Christian approaches anyone and everyone they interact with, or at least encourages it, to have their interests in their mind, their cashier, their waiter, their waitress, their teacher, their coach, their roommate, their parents, wh whoever it is that's in your life, he assumes that this is the way that we should operate. So how do you do it? How do you set your attitude, this set way of thinking on humility? Uh, I think that it's... Uh, Paul just goes on to talk about verse 6 through 11. <laughs> that though he was God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be clinged onto, but he gave himself up. Uh, Max, he, me he messed with that anthill. Okay? And we didn't think much of it. We kind of laughed when he just rode over the ants. <laughs> it's just trash. It doesn't matter. But the difference between Max and an ant does not even come close to comparing to the difference in glory between us and God. The gap between us and God is so much greater. And it's not even close. And I hope that hits your heart. That God became a man. It's beautiful. The way that you change your attitude is by letting that reality pierce yourself. And it, it can be instantaneous, but it usually isn't instantaneous. It necessitates meditation. Like if I want some tea, I don't dip the tea bag in for four seconds in hot water. If I dip the tea bag in for four seconds, do I have tea? No. You have to let it steep. You have to let this truth steep in your soul in the morning and in the evening and in the afternoon and when you're anxious and when you're frustrated 
and when you're tempted to view others like their ants, when they're totally not, that every single person that you pass is an eternal being. I have too much to go through. I'm going to end there. (laughs) Let it steep. Let the gospel steep in your soul. Let the reality that God became man steep in your soul. Let it affect the way that you think about yourself. Let it, that, that, that you are not, it's not about glorifying yourself. It's about glorifying God. That it, it would affect the way that you treat others to be a stepping stone for them. How can you do that? The only way is to recognize that Jesus went far lower for you. Let it pierce you. Let it drive you. May tonight may you filter all of your decisions, all that you do, the way that you treat people, the strategies for the sake of the gospel, let all that you do be filtered through the humility of Christ Jesus, which is displayed in the fullness of his deity, dwelling completely in human form. Pray with me, God. How cool. That you came to earth as a man. And how cool that you planned that from the very beginning. That you even give us indications all throughout scripture of the fact that, that you as a man were going to be our substitute. And I pray that it doesn't that we don't minimize that. This is the, 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 a big struggle of our lives to view and see you as you actually are. So help us to see you in your humanity and the implications of your, your, your humanity, that in your humanity you were the substitute for us, the sufficient substitute. Help us to go in that grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.